Hi, thank you all for having us here today. I'm Charlotte Danielson, and this is Una King. We're just gonna, since we already took care of the intros, we'll just go straight into our uh, discussion or questions. I'm gonna interview Una here today. So um, I'm gonna start off by first, you know, we, we have a lot of people in general, you hear sort of like it's the right thing to do to increase diversity, but uh, more and more research is coming out showing that there's actually a good business case for doing that. Can you discuss a little bit about that? Okay, well, hi, Charlotte. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for remaining in the room for the diversity uh, question. Um, that's fantastic, especially because, as you say, the business case is absolutely crucial. Um, and more and more people realize that. I mean, look, it would be great if we could get people to channel their sort of inner Gandhi, they're in a Martin Luther King, because we know it's the right thing to do. But you know, it turns out quite often people channel their inner Donald Trump. Um, and the thing is that even in this circumstance, especially in this circumstance, you should focus on diversity because it is in business terms the right thing to do. And that's been proven again and again and again. I, we, we don't have time for me to cite all the research, but there is a ton. Start with McKenzie. Um, you can look at all the work that's been done by uh, all the consultancy firms. You can even just look, just yesterday I came across a report looking at the um, top 10 Hollywood blockbusters over the last years. It was 415 films. And of the top 10, seven in their opening weekend had a majority audience that was an ethnic minority. So the majority of the audience was ethnic minority. So ethnic minority, you know, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, and what we say in Google and YouTube uh, is it's not about, for instance, marketing. We do a lot of marketing, a lot of advertising, etc. It's not about marketing. Um, it's not about multicultural marketing. It's about marketing in a multicultural world. So if you want to make money, uh, you know, channel diversity. I also, just to, to add to that a little bit, we read some uh, recent article that talked about uh, how it actually increased the social good in the sense that a more diverse economy in addition to being profitable and um, uh, increasing sort of the, the innovation, which is important, you get better innovation outcomes, is the fact that economies and societies tend to be more stable when they are doing that, which of course is very important uh, in our current political world. Um, moving on, I wanted to say, you know, we see, thankfully, there are uh, more and more of a trend of companies in the, the uh, Silicon Valley area uh, starting off to have uh, actual uh, diversity and inclusion departments, which of course, you know, you can credit your employment to and other people in your area, which is a great thing to see. And we see them actually coming out with their statistics more and being more transparent um, and uh, setting goals for what they want to achieve in that. What, what do you see beyond that sort of in the future coming up that is, are the trends in uh, diversity and inclusion work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, of course, I back diversity because it's the only way I could get a job, clearly. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the trends really are around data, transparency, and accountability. I mean, the data, um, when I was first elected to the British Parliament, I was 29 years old, and I really couldn't be bothered with gender stuff because I'd studied war studies at university. I was all about foreign policy, and I wasn't going to be tied to the kitchen sink, and I wasn't going to be tied to women's issues. Um, and when you realize that there's only, out of 650 members of parliament, there's only one other black woman. Her name was Diane, incidentally, and for 10 years I was called Diane. Um, I didn't really hold it against them because all the white male ministers, they all look the same to me as well. So, you know, fair enough. Um, but the point is, in those circumstances, it's really easy to understand the data. 650 MPs, two black women, overall there were 10. Uh, ethnic minority MPs. The data is very simple. In fact, diversity data is incredibly complex these days, and you need collaboration to be able to get that data. You need to harmonize. I heard earlier the conversation about harmonization. You need to harmonize what data you're collecting. So the example I gave, uh, I, I usually give is, um, I worked as the head of diversity for a British broadcaster, Channel 4. Um, hopefully some of you have heard of Channel 4. Uh, anyway, uh, in 
Hollywood, they say they never have. And I'm like, what, did you not hear of our film that won the best Oscar, 12 Years a Slave? And they're like, oh, yeah, maybe we have heard of it. Um, the point is, what Channel 4 decided to do was for the first time to actually... Uh, measure along with the other key broadcasters in the UK. So collaborate with the BBC, with Sky, with ITV, um, with Channel 5, now owned by Viacom. And what that meant was we were able for the first time to start collecting diversity data at an industry level collate it at an industry level and then get much more detailed insights into different genres, into where there were different issues around diversity. And just one example, I know incidentally we're in Silicon Valley, I've got no time for any answer. I'm out of time already, aren't I? Which is tricky when you come from the House of Lords. If you get anything done there within 300 years, you're ahead. Um, but here... <laughs> Here, it doesn't work that way. Um, so I would give you a fabulous anecdote um, on this issue, which I'll keep if we have one second at the end. But the point is the trends are transparency, accountability, and ensuring that managers take accountability for the diversity within their workforce and for creating the culture change that enables minority groups to not just survive, but thrive. And so uh, any group that's uh, facing ceilings, so whether it's um, LGBT or minority or women, um, all sort of have a lot of things in common in terms of their own experiences with trying to get ahead and, and facing uh, barriers in doing that. But I want to, in these next two questions, actually sort of separate them out a little so we, we don't lump it together. Uh, and I want to talk about women first, or gender. Uh, because that's one that's been uh, very much in the news in, in this area uh, recently. You know, we have uh, with Ellen Powell's lawsuit against Kleiner Perkins, Susan Fowler speaking out about Uber, uh, and of course, most recently, uh, the uh, allegations against uh, Dave McClure of 500 Startups. Just to name a few, there are so many examples, we could spend the whole time just talking about that. Um, but what do you think uh, needs to be done to improve the situation for women in tech, and what responsibility do larger tech companies like YouTube have in setting higher standards and really taking the lead and making the change happen? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so just out of interest, um, here in the room, how many people either live or work in Silicon Valley? And how many of you live or work, well, I guess it would be the same, in Europe, unless you've got a really long commute? Right, okay, so nearly kind of 50-50. Um, I'd say there is some differences, uh, at, you know, obviously having spent my life as a European uh, and coming here Thanksgiving last year, though I didn't know, did you know that Thanksgiving is based on uh, the genocide of Native American Indians, which I thought was quite interesting, but anyway, I digress. Um, so, the point is, in terms of gender here in Silicon Valley, um, and in fact throughout the world, I mean, the gender question just doesn't go away, does it? Um, and obviously there are some basic things we need to do um, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, in terms of the tech industry in particular, yes, of course, we need to uh, encourage girls to code. We need to encourage more girls into um, computer science. Having said that, we're not yet employing all the women that come out uh, with computer science degrees. So it's not just um, matching market supply. We have to go beyond that. Um, but with women, and this is where actually the groups like women and um, ethnic minorities and people with disabilities that we don't hear enough about, LGBTQ, and age as well. In fact, sort of basically all of us, one way or another, um, where I think it's interesting for us to look at how we break the cycle of this underrepresentation is stereotypes. And what are we gonna do to actually disrupt, we talk about technology disrupting, what can we do to disrupt the age old human psyche that is built on stereotypes? That's how our brain functions. We couldn't work if we didn't have shortcuts in our brains which are otherwise known as stereotypes. And the problem is they work for us quite well uh, in many areas, but not when it comes to a work environment and not in terms of Silicon Valley. So you asked about the responsibility that YouTube and Google has. My personal passion uh, is looking at how Google can use the new technology around uh, AI to tackle bias at scale. I'll give you just one statistic, for example. Girls decide, talking of gender, um, girls decide that they are not interested in technology and STEM subjects on average 
by the age of six. The age of six. So what are they watching <laughs> between birth? We hope they're not watching TV at birth, but between one and six, two years and six years old, what are they watching? Well, increasingly it is actually YouTube, for example. Um, that's why I moved from British Broadcasting and the British Parliament to YouTube, because I think that's where you influence the next generation. And I'm really looking um, to my own company and to others here in Silicon Valley to do that disruption that Silicon Valley is so famous for, but to do it within the realms of actually fundamentally disrupting stereotypes. And I have very specific proposals that I don't have to go into now, but I, I mean, I'm not just blathering away, right? I mean, there's some, some really, uh, really interesting tech being developed right now that would also help in terms of tackling fake news, for example, because a stereotype at the end of the day is the germ at the heart of any hate speech. You know, it's on a spectrum. If you can come up with the computing that has the human sensibility equivalent to, to understand context and be able to tackle a stereotype, you can also tackle uh, hate speech and uh, inflammatory content and uh, uh, fake news, etc. So huge issue. It wouldn't just help women or ethnic minorities, it would help humans. Okay, now let's uh, use our last question here to focus in a little bit more on race and ethnicity um, and racism in particular. And I know a lot of times we hear excuses for uh, African Americans or Latinos not getting up high enough in offices because, you know, the education level isn't quite there um, or uh, there isn't enough of a pipeline coming up yet. Um, but it's, so the... the uh, 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 example that shows it isn't all about that, I think, are Asian Americans in tech. Um, you see, actually, that Asian Americans make up um, over 50% of the tech professional workforce in Silicon Valley, but only 8% of the board members, only 12% of the upper management. Uh, and this is a population group that actually has two times higher the educational level uh, than the general population, and uh, both at the bachelor's and graduate level. So there does very much seem to be actual racism in this equation. So I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about that? Is racism really playing a role, and uh, what can be done to advance uh, ethnic minorities in leadership positions? Yeah, this is a brilliant point. I mean, look, Racism is alive and well. I mean, you don't need to just look at images from Charlottesville, among many others, and hear pronouncements, um, you know, linked to white supremacists uh, to know that it's going well. Um, and the point you make is a really important one about Asians over-indexing in terms of their qualifications and yet under-indexing in terms of leadership positions. I mean, that there just knocks the nail on the head. And, um, you know, I mean, it's funny. I, I remember, for instance, my first Prime Minister's question time, I asked a question, I come out, and all of these conservative, I mean, I was Labour, what a surprise, but all of these conservative politicians, mainly conservative men, because there weren't very many conservative women, but anyway, threw themselves on top of me, and they were like, oh, my God, you were amazing, you were incredible, that was wonderful. And what I realised, I wasn't, I hadn't been that great, it was just they were like, oh my God, she's a black woman and she can walk and talk at the same time. This is extraordinary. Um, and it comes back to these very deeply ingrained stereotypes that they have. And the Asian population in particular, in this country in particular, really, really suffers uh, from that. I mean, so the last thing I'd want to uh, end on, because I, I know I, in Silicon Valley we're always out of time. I can't really see that timer. Apparently we have three minutes. Oh, that's like three hours here, isn't it? Um, so I would like, on, in relation to this point, I would like to tell you the story. How many of you had a story this afternoon, huh? How about I tell you a little story? Right, so um, this was when the head of film at Channel 4 decided, you know, it's a, it's a British broadcaster, completely commercially, uh, it gets its money entirely commercially, but the taxpayer enables it to exist, so it has a remit from Parliament to promote diversity and to serve everyone, right? And she was like, uh, this, is, this is sort of like 2004, 2005. She said, we have never invested in a black film director. This is terrible. Go out and find me a black film director that we can invest in. So her whole team looks everywhere, and you know, you will find the same thing. Let's imagine, I know, you're all good guys, mainly guys, 
mainly good, right? You're good guys, you decide, yeah, we'd like to increase diversity. And your HR people or your hiring managers will go, you know, the talent's just not there. Oh, we would if we could, but it's just not there. And that's what the head of film, Film 4, was told at Channel 4. And so what she said to her team was, well, no, go out and look again. And she extended the search period by another six months. Six months later, they come back and they were like, no, literally, there is not one black person we can find in the United Kingdom that is a filmmaker of the caliber that we would invest in. And you know what she said? And this is what I would love you to say when your hiring managers or others in your organization say the same thing. She said, well, in that case, either we're asking for the wrong qualifications or we're looking in the wrong talent pool. Because it just isn't possible that there isn't a single black person or person of color in the United Kingdom that could be a successful film director. And so then she said, you know what, okay, forget it. We won't look for a film director. We'll look for a visual artist and we'll train them up. First of all, what's the lesson? She took a long time. It takes time to develop a relationship and give someone that training that can bring them on. Second of all, she was creative and innovative, looked in a different area. Um, Third of all, and here's the great thing, when that director won the Oscar for Best Film, which he did, Steve McQueen, <laughs> um, 12 Years a Slave, do you think everyone was sitting there going, oh, that was an affirmative action program. Oh, he only got that opportunity because he was black. No, he got that opportunity because he had the talent to be one of the greatest film directors in the world, but talent rarely meets opportunity. That's what we have to do. That's the disruption we need, to give talent opportunity. And if you can do that, if you take the risks like she took, you get a payback at the end as well. So it is good for business. Do both, if you must, channel Trump, but mainly remember, if you channel a bit of Gandhi, if you channel a bit of Martin Luther King, you will get a business payback. I really hope you will. Thank you. Thank you all.